I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby here with uh, Neil Patrick Harris, who stars in It's a Sin, uh, the magnificent new uh, limited series from Russell T. Davies. And Neil, um, you know, th this show, I think for, for people of yours and my generation, we're about the same age. And, you know, uh, for some of us, we grew up during this time period, but we didn't really know uh, a lot of the stuff that was going on. Was that one of the things that attracted you to this? I suppose as a bit of a, um, of a history lesson, that was probably valid. I was just a, a massive Russell T. Davies fan. Um, so for me, it was less needing to tell the story, but like blown away that he was telling the story. Surprised that no one had told the story, you know, from the UK's perspective before. Um, but I just held, I hold him up to a very on a very high pedestal when I was uh, questioning coming out and like wondering what that conversation would look like. There weren't a lot of examples of um, hot guys on film being sort of virile and, and exciting. And then I saw Queer as Folk, the UK version. And I don't even know how I saw it because I think it, well, it must have been a VHS tape or because there was no streaming back then. And I, I was I have California. the same VHS. <laughs> yeah, it must have been, I right? Have the same one. And I just thought that that show was so hot. I mean, first of all, it's British. Hello. They're just like, I just think that they're that that great, the great duality of being um, respectful and proper and good sentence structure and articulate and also kind of randy and cheeky and and wink wink that i loved and then they just the actors themselves were just it was very freeing it was very inspiring for me to see actors doing that straight or gay just to see that it was being filmed so i have always wanted to work with him in some capacity never thought i would since i live in the states and then i got a phone call from him and his producing partner saying that they were doing this thing and they had this part and would I be interested in doing it? He was very um, like vague about it all, not for secrecy thing, sake. I just think as it was an uh, initial call and I was on board right away. Like, absolutely. Whatever you want me to do. I would love to go to Manchester, learn an accent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then I found that I was only in a, a, a limited part of it, which was fine because it made it easier to say yes because I didn't have to uh, see if I was available for all that <laughs> duration. But I was, uh, yeah, I was on board from the from the get. Well, what did he tell you about Henry? Did he tell you anything about about what type of character this was going to be? No, he didn't. He said he wanted to have him be. Um, so he did say that he would be a character that um, is only in the first episode and is one of the first that we see that dies of AIDS. And, um, and that he was in one of the characters story and, you know, sort of broad strokes. And I thought, yeah, for, again, for sure, dude, whatever you, <laughs> whatever you want, let me know. But then when I read it, I, I was, I loved the journey that Henry was able to take, which sounds like a really cheesy thing to say, but, but I start with the story and, and sort of see how I, as an actor, can help facilitate the story that's being told, as opposed to mm, sometimes actors can be more myopic and think like, this is what I'm going to do. I see what the story is, but I'm going to take it to the next level. I don't really process it that way. I sort of think, how can I be most effective in the story being told? So on as scripted, I just found Henry to be very intriguing because... Um, Colin comes to the big city, uh, very naive, gets a job in a very posh environment. And that's when he meets this other gentleman. So immediately when I'm reading it, I think, oh, he's, he's an adversary. He's going to be a bad guy that's going to get him fired at the end or something. Then through circumstance, he ends up having to save him, but in a very kind of glib way. And then befriends him, outs him, then reveals himself to be a super lovely kind of monogamous long-term example of how Colin could be, but not hitting you over the head with it, just existing through example. And then losing his partner, unsure of what's happening. So there's a great level of sort of, of 
unknown conflict of like questioning concern. And then boom, cut to the end, has it himself, doesn't know what its name is, left fully isolated um, and still just racking his brain, trying to figure out what happened. I just found that trajectory, maybe bad guy, good friend, <laughs> life example, uh, and then fall from grace in a way um, that, that you don't get those parts very often. I would, I would assume that, 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 that last scene uh, in, the, in the hospital ward, I mean, the atmosphere alone has to be a big help in, in getting to that kind of emotional place. But did you do a hmm. lot of research about, about what AIDS patients go through? Did you, or did you just trust basically the atmosphere and the script? I did a little bit of research and in doing it, I actually sort of stopped um, for a very singular reason, because what I was speaking, um, the lines that were written for me were all ones of questioning, like, I, what is it, you know? I remember that there was mold a on mold. a countertop and it's like, if I had just gotten that, and I just found that so like devastating to read that, that I didn't really want to know about examples of things that have happened in other people. I mean, being spending hours in a, a makeup trailer with lots of photos of, of real examples of what people look like and where lesions are and, you know, what level of jaundice is appropriate and what is garish and like really wanting to be respectful that, that alone sort of gets you in a headspace. And then I was just laying in that bed while they were lighting things. And it was just a very lonely environment. I'm also away from my family in another country. And so the loneliness was, was all the emotion that I needed. I mean, it's part of your job as an actor too, to, to find that stuff. And I certainly have lots of emotional resources to, 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 you know, to tap into, but it was not hard given what was written. I just still find that. So I tear up when I watch myself do it, which was weird. Cause I never do that. I'm usually very critical, not critical, just I'm usually out of my head, but there's just something. So maybe because it was through the eyes of Colin and just to watch him process all of this potential and 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 see it um see the tragic end to it i don't know that's just it was really a it was a beautiful thing to to watch to witness i guess beautiful but you know in yeah its own way. No, but and 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 your co-star in many of your scenes callum scott howells really does um he for my money really is the breakout of this series i mean i mean he's he's this young guy who I'd never heard of and, and, and really just brings this level of sweetness. What was the working relationship between you two? Because there's such a connection there. Oh, thanks. I, I appreciate you saying that. I think the world of Callum, he's, he's like remarkably authentic. He is, um, he is very wide eyed and green in almost every way. One way that he's not is that he's really skilled as an actor and he's, he's still, I think in school studying it, or maybe he's quit cause he's like working, but he's like, <laughs> but he's, he's amazing and, and, and talented, but he's able to fuse those two things together, I think, which makes him a, a real powerhouse because he deserves, he has every right to be cocky and, and egotistical and looking forward to the next thing and sharing stories of things he's done. And he's the antithesis of that. He's, oh, Neil, this is so, everyone's been so lovely, everything. And tell me more about when you did the Tonys. What was it like, Neil? I watched it, <laughs> I watched it 10 times in my bedroom, I did. He is so adorable. And so it was fun to do the scenes with him. And then to be honest, like watching him in his big episodes later on, you're whacked over the head with the talent that that kid has. Cause he, in turn, you should ask him, but he did a lot of research on the very specific subtleties of how brain function is, um, is lost when you're in specific throes of HIV AIDS. And his, his stuff was really hard to watch given how lovely he is as a person authentically, you know? 
He's a great guy. I hope you take this question the right way because it's meant lovingly. Um, the the you know, you've been an actor for so long, and you've all you know you were the youngest person on a set at one time, and now you know you're older, you have more experience. Um, did you find that position in 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 a show that's predominantly you know with LGBTQ actors? Um, did you find that position to be strange or weird at, in any way? I've always felt a little bit younger than I am. Um, and I've wanted to, like, I'm on a trajectory, I think, to be directing more. And even, I, I recently turned 48 years old. But even still at 48, I feel like, I don't know that I'm going to be taken seriously as a director because I still feel young. So in a lot of ways, I've, I've grown up feeling like, I had something to prove. And I think that comes from a level of feeling younger than, and I don't know if that's just an energy that I have within me or whatever, but I'll tell you something. It's changed radically in the last decade because I have, we have 10 year old children and having kids like is a real game changer for feeling young versus old. Cause you really do you get to use all that you've learned when you're teaching. And, and so teaching kids. So I, so I, long ramble answer to your short question. I, when I was there with those, with th those people, I was very proud to be with them. I was, I was really honored to find situations where I could observe them and sort of breathe in their ether. These people were doing a big job, like a, like hours and hours and hours of film at the pink palace, lots of intimacy coordinators because they were doing propers like sex scenes, like they were dancing, they were living their acting life together. And that's a great time to be alive as an actor. And I wasn't a part of those scenes, but I was able a couple of times to, to like hang out with them after work or invite them all to a drink or something and, and see them laughing at each other's jokes and finishing each other's sentences and, and I, yeah, I felt, I don't, I mean, they were nice to me and, and I have lots of random stories that you can hear I tell, but, um, but it was fun to just see them all and Russell cast it so well. I think, I mean, I, I can't think of a single person in that, in that five, some Amari, Nathaniel, Ollie, Lydia and Callum, they're all so talented and they've, for the most part, not done very much. Lydia West, who's one of my favorite female actresses going right now. I mean, she had done the most, I guess. But to watch all these people who really haven't done much um, feeling so alive um, and not having it be inauthentic, they really do still like each other that much. And, and I think it shows. I, I'm always proud to be part of projects that you can watch later and still um, find value in. Randomly, I've gotten to do a few, like the Harold and Kumars, people still like them. Starship Troopers, people still like, still holds up. But when you can do something that, that holds up, but also can be important, you know, that's other level. Getting to do something where a generation of viewers really can be affected by it because they remember it is a big deal. Getting to do it for another generation that may not even know about it that's a big deal. So I'm so proud of all of them for getting to do the work that they did and for people watching it and liking it and hopefully, you know, being changed by it. I love, one of the things I love about Russell T Davies is in a lot of his series, he teaches you things without it ever feeling like you're sitting in a chair being forced to learn something. There's entertainment and there's education. How do you think he does that? What, what is it about him that, 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 can do that so well i don't know i don't know <laughs> i don't know he is have you ever had a conversation with him like no. interviewed him no when you do and i can't wait for that experience for you it's as if you've been friends for a very long time and his 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 ability to be very conversational and include you in in the conversation in a very authentic loving way is is rare because he's so prolific that he has every right to sit and let you start the conversation and judge you and see if you're smart enough for him to tell that story. I've met a lot of people that 
that you know are writers that you know you need to kind of pr prove your worth for them to engage with you he's just the opposite of that and i think when you watch the dialogue scenes and the and and the forward momentum of his writing that's probably why he's just you want to go on a road trip with the guy you know you want him to to take you around and show you all his favorite places or at least have a a pint with him at a at a place I, he's just and he's had some big consequential loss in his life you know he's had some some real highs and lows and yet he still is very just lovely i don't know his knowledge of the human spirit at any level age level i mean like when you look at at those three shows that he did about being uh, being gay and older in the uk what was it cucumber and yeah uh banana and yeah some other dildo kind of <laughs> <vegetable. Well, laughs> uh, but he was in those able to be very colloquial and Con contemporary, whether writing for a man who's 60 or 50 or whether writing for someone who's 21. I don't know, man, that's, that's skill. I can't talk to you and not talk about the theater community because that, that has been such a huge part of your, of your background. Um, and it's been so decimated by what we've all gone through for the last year and a half. What does it mean to you now that you are starting to see these announcements about Broadway and theater in general, in-person live theater coming back? Um, I'm cautiously optimistic. I don't think that the theater community was decimated any more than most other um, professions. I mean, give or take a few, it, it, the pandemic has really run its course on the restaurant industry was just destroyed in ways that they don't get to come back. I mean, theater will come back. There's something innate and inevitable about actors needing to share stories. And a lot of the best stories are created and told through bad circumstance, right? Um, and even historically, when you look at it. So this was a year and a half where I think we'll find that a new breed of writers have, have found their voices and have been stuck in a room with no windows, pacing back and forth, like getting ready to share what they, you know, what they are learning and feeling. So I expect a new renaissance of, of content. At the same time, I really do hope that New York can bounce back in a, in a quick way. And I just encourage all the theater owners to spend the money to update and upgrade their, the, their theater systems so that backstage and on stage and in the audience, there's airflow and stuff. I mean, it's a very small little niche group of cats that own all of those theaters and not all of them care so much about everyone in that. They're, they're bottom line people, but it's, it's, it's common known fact that during the flu season on, on Broadway, I mean, flus go through the cast like crazy, you know, you're on stage sweating and kissing and backstage and you're all like, it's, you're all together all the time. And there's, and, and, and this is other level, right? So you have to have an audience that feels safe enough to really enjoy themselves and not feel concerned. You have to have a, a, a crew backstage that feels um, supported enough that they can go to work and be proud. And then you have to have a cast of people that feel like they can really perform at hundred percent. I'm anxious to see what happens. Obviously super glad that all these shows are coming back. Um, and I really pray that there's not, you know, weird, um, weird outbreaks that create, you know, new storylines. I really hope that mm. everyone can band together and make it, make it really happen because, it's great. It's great for, it's great for business. It's great for tourism, but it's great to see a show and, and be, uh, and, and escape into someone else's world, whether it's a play about people you didn't even know or play about people you do know, and you find something out that you didn't realize, or whether it's a musical where you get to just totally escape and vanish into it. I mean, those are, those are life-changing experiences for lots and lots of people. And it's not the same when you're watching it on a screen. I don't know if it's better or worse. It's just not the same. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can't wait for the day when there's thousands of people 
loving it and giving standing ovations to those that work so hard. Amen to that. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Emmys and stay tuned with interviews with more uh, contenders throughout the season. Neil Patrick Harris, thank you so much. Cheers, thank you.